one of the very few events where everybody's actually here before 7.15 and, you know, we're starting pretty much on time, so, yay. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to quickly introduce uh, uh, introduce us. Uh, uh, I'm Gargi and this is Russell. And we're the co-presidents of the university-wide Harvard Alumni Club. And uh, today we're working in um, partnership with the Harvard Alumni Association in Boston, uh, with the Harvard Business School India Research Center, and with the South Asia Institute at Harvard uh, to put this uh, event together for you. Um, I'm uh, quickly just going to run through the format of the event and uh, then give you a quick introduction to our panelists. Um, our first, uh, uh, it, we're, we're going to have 15 minute, uh, uh, you know, sessions with each of the panelists where each of them will speak, after which if you could hold all your questions because we'll have a 30 minute um, combined um, questions uh, session at the end. So each speaker will speak for 15 minutes and then all the questions will be taken together at the end. So, um, uh, and Russell here will be helping moderate that time. So uh, just to quickly uh, introduce you. Uh, first, oh, I'd like to introduce Jorge. Um, uh, Jorge Dominguez is the Antonio Madero Professor for the Study of Mexico. And from my brief interactions with him and his former students, uh, he's one of also the most popular professors at the university. <laughs> uh, he's also the Vice Provost for International Affairs, Special mm -hmm. uh, Advisor for International Students, uh, sorry, Special Advisor for International Studies to the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and Chairman of the Harvard a Academy for International and Area Studies. He is the author of many books and articles on domestic and international politics in Latin America and the Caribbean. He's a past president of the, uh, of the Latin American Student uh, Studies Association and a past board chairman of the Latin America Scholarship Program of American Universities. Uh, he currently serves on the editorial boards of Political Science Quarterly, Foreign Affairs, uh, Latin America, Cuban Studies, Foro Internacional, and Journal of uh, Cold War Studies. He was also series editor for the Peabody Award-winning uh, PBS television series Crisis in Central America. His current research focuses on the international relations and domestic politics of Latin American countries. Um, uh, Ashish Nanda, uh, as a, a lot of you know, is the Robert Bro Broker Professor of, um, sorry, Professor of Practice at Harvard Law School. Uh, I think that this, I w as I was telling him earlier, I think that this might actually be one of the events where we've gotten so many law le legal minds in here and law school students in here. Usually you guys are hiding and today it's good to see, see you out of the woodworks. <laughs> so um, uh, he teaches uh, leadership in law firms and professional services. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, he teaches uh, le leadership in law firms and professional services advanced topics in the JD program is faculty director of executive education and is research director at the program on the legal profession. Uh, before joining Harvard Law School, uh, Ashish was, a, was an HBS faculty member for 13 years and uh, where he continued to teach in executive ed, uh, continues to teach in executive ed courses. He also advises law firms and in, is inside counsel to a slew of professional companies um, and uh, to, uh, you know, is uh, and his, and his work with them has spanned strategic planning, uh, developing organizational strategy, reviewing governance systems, and um, analyzing people practices. Um, uh, Jacqueline today is from our uh, Jacqueline Baba today is from my alma mater. Um, she is from the um, uh, she's the uh, FXB director of uh, research pra uh, professor of the practice of health and human rights uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, she's also the Jeremiah Smith uh, a Junior Le Lecturer in Law at Harvard Law School and Adjunct Lecturer in Public Policy at the Kennedy School. So I think she's uh, appealing to a lot of our audience today. Um, from 1997 to 2001, Jacqueline directed the Human Rights Program at the University of Chicago. <coughs> Prior to 1997, she was a practicing human rights lawyer in London and at the uh, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Uh, she has published extensively on issues of transnational child mi um, migration, refugee protection, children's rights, and citizenship. <coughs> she also serves on the board of the Scholars at Risk Network, the World Peace Foundation, and the Journal of Refugee Studies. She's also the founder of the ALBA Collective, an international women's NGO currently working with rural women and girls in developing countries to enhance uh, financial security and youth rights. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Jorge to please step up here to, to address us. Thank you. I must say, as I walk in, this, this, uh, this room feels familiar. Uh, it, uh, I can't imagine the Charles River uh, behind those windows. And, uh, 
Cambridge and Boston on both sides. I am I'm thrilled to be back in Mumbai. This is the first time in this uh, facility, and I'm grateful, therefore, to the Harvard Alumni Club of Mumbai, uh, to the Harvard University uh, India Research Center of the Harvard Business School, Harvard University South Asia Institute, uh, you know, and the uh, Harvard Alumni Association in Boston as well for this, and to all of you come. So the topic that we've been asked to address as a panel uh, deals with the construction of a world-class, global sense of perspective for higher education. Uh, and my particular element of it is to try to uh, say a few words, let me make sure that there are a few, uh, uh, focused on the Harvard experience. And what occurred to me is to spend uh, at least half of my time, maybe a little more, talking uh, in a nice <coughs> way, perhaps, but about Harvard mistakes. Uh, it, it's more effective <coughs> to talk to you about Harvard mistakes, in part because it's more humble, uh, and in part because what I'm about to tell you took a long time to build, uh, took a long time to develop. There were many errors along the way, and I'm not pretending, therefore, that it is easy for any institution, nor that Harvard is done in bringing about these sorts of changes. So my theme about how <coughs> is it that Harvard came to be uh, both a research university uh, and an institution whose ambitions and whose people span the world is about the construction of freedom. And the construction of freedom uh, has to be put that way because the institution was founded under circumstances and existed for many years that were not free. So at the very beginning, uh, it was a Protestant seminary uh, to train Puritans in circumstances of religious intolerance and monopoly power uh, of the uh, Puritan church. Uh, for the history of the university, the first freedom that had to be constructed was freedom from the church. Freedom from the church broadly understood, church, if you will, with small c, because it meant all of them. Uh, freedom from dogma. Freedom to be able to empower, to authorize, and to foster the capacity and the creativity of every member of the university community to explore ideas and to develop them as she or he would think it best. <coughs> that freedom from dogmatism uh, is at the heart of the construction of a university that both emphasizes its research and education mission and that also seeks to uh, encounter the world as it has come to be. Second kind of freedom is from, might be called from labor market protectionism. Labor market protectionism constructed above all by what the U.S. immigration laws came to be, especially in the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 1950s. But also a labor market protectionism that the university had built on its own. Harvard faculty for a long, long time uh, were inbred Harvard faculty for a long time were the children of those who had been Harvard faculty already, were the children of those who had been students. And it took a very long time to realize that the criterion for <coughs> appointment to the faculty, or to the admission to the university, ought to be that you're good at what you're doing, that you actually deserve to be there, that you have the merits, that you have earned it, that you can show leadership. And particularly on the global side, it is only at the late 1930s when the university begins to appoint <coughs> a large number of non-U.S. citizens who were fleeing Europe under the Nazis. And that experience continues to develop uh, through and following World War II. It's not that it was the first time that it had appointed non-U.S. citizens, but it is the first time that there is a significant leap, a significant change, a significant transformation. Today, uh, the deans of the Harvard Business School, of the Harvard School of Public Health, of the Harvard Graduate School of Design, of the Harvard Divinity School, of the Harvard Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, or the PhD program, have one characteristic. They were all born outside of the United States. 
they have gotten at least one university degree outside of the United States. This is a very different Harvard from the parochial place that it was in the 17th century, in the 18th century, in the 19th. It took a very long time to construct this freedom from thinking that only those born in the United States could be deans at Harvard. Today, 29% of Harvard scientists uh, either were born outside of the United States or have a university degree from a university from outside of the United States. Because we look for the best people wherever they are, many of them in India, many of them in Europe, many of them in China, many of them in everywhere in the world. And the proportion of non-U.S. citizens among social scientists and humanists uh, is even larger. Freedom from dogmatism, freedom from thinking that only those who are born in the United States uh, deserve an appointment. Freedom from arrogance. The word Harvard and the word humility both begin with the letter H and the same sound of huh. <laughs> but they're almost never used in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, in order to become a university that is a research institution and that really tries to operate globally, we had to recognize that it's not good enough to think that we're good. We need to make sure that we test the hypothesis. We need to proceed in some sense as scholars to ensure this. And that is why it took a long time. The university and its members have constructed and supported mechanisms of peer review. Peer review for the publication of articles in scholarly journals. Peer review for the publication of books. A peer review for uh, the uh, assessment of the quality of departments, of the quality of schools. Peer review in the appointment of uh, senior faculty. That means we write to faculty all over the world. Is this person the person that we should appoint? Uh, that is why we do it to the extent possible anonymously to ensure the quality of the work that we do. Freedom from arrogance means to recognize that there are others who may be better than we are and that therefore we ought to be motivated to strive and to try to do it better. Freedom from dogmatism. Freedom from thinking that we're the only good ones. Freedom from arrogance. The next freedom is freedom from people like me, <laughs> university bureaucrats. Uh, we need professors, not vice provosts, not presidents, not the trustees of the university. We need professors to determine what they're going to be working on, what they're going to be teaching, how they're going to do it how they're going to proceed. That is called <coughs> academic freedom, but it really means, above all, freedom from university bureaucrats like me. It's not easy for any university president, for any dean, uh, to forego the alleged right <coughs> to command a university professor to do this type of work and not some other type of work, but to do it this way and not to do it that way. And whenever universities attempt that, they go wrong. Their quality goes down. The best people refuse to work there and leave and go to some other uh, institution or go to industry or go to a think tank. Universities depend on the freedom of the faculty uh, to explore, to think hard, and on the freedom of the students to do the same. The fifth and last freedom, I don't want to go on too long because you're, my 15 minutes will be up. The fifth freedom is freedom from our own history, <coughs> particularly freedom uh, in our own history in processes that impeded the admission of students and the appointment of faculty who were the best and who brought about a wide variety of experiences and values. Harvard has an awful, damnable history of excluding blacks, of excluding Jews, of excluding a great many foreigners of excluding women for the bulk of their history from admissions to the university or from appointments to the faculty. Freedom from that past took a long time. It was not easy, and it is a struggle that took place again and again. And now, in many ways, we have changed, and in of the categories that I mentioned that the university had excluded in the past or had heavily discriminated against, 
In many ways, the last frontier is to make sure that when we look at the admissions of students, we look at the best students that we can find, wherever they may be. To put it with a simple word is, I want, and we now are increasingly doing, the admissions of students and the allocation of financial aid to students passport blind. Passport blind. What that means is the construction of a university that is a public institution. By public meaning universal access. You're good. You work hard. You're talented. You're willing to do the best work. And if you are family earned, fewer than 65,000 US dollars per year, and that means most of India, Harvard to you, Harvard College to you, is free. Free means free. Free means you pay zero tuition. Free means we, the room where you are, you don't have to pay for. Free means we pay for your food. Free means, particularly if you come from India, you get a winter overcoat. We are the cheapest public institution <coughs> anywhere in the, the world for the vast majority of Indians. That's a different heart. That is freedom from the past that had been exclusionary. That is a very different world. And the good news is once you accomplish or keep building and make progress to have these freedoms at work, faculty, faculty choose to appoint others who are unlike themselves, who are good at what they do, uh, and choose to work all over the world. So today, over 60% of the faculty of the Graduate School of Design, over 60% of the faculty of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and of the Harvard Business School, tell us that they do significant work in countries outside of the United States. Similarly, we know today, we know today <coughs> that Harvard faculty committees in admissions admits a university student body that is far more global than it ever had been. Over the past 20 years, the number of non-US passport <coughs> holders enrolled in Harvard degree programs has uh, more than double the number of students from India in Harvard degree programs has tripled. This is now 264 across the degrees of the university. And the trend is up. I have no idea what is the right number of Indians at Harvard, but I do know that it is a four-letter word, more. And we depend on you to help us construct that better Harvard. We now operate, operate means our faculty go, our students go, in no fewer than 130 countries of the world. Last year it was 144. Operate means we spend Harvard money. That's what it means. And we try to do the kinds of things that so many of you in this room, and Anjali as its leader, uh, uh, head us, which is we have an office here, to facilitate research, to facilitate education, to facilitate engagement, and some of which we do in this classroom. It took time. It's not over. It is a task of every day. But the construction of freedom for the university, for the research, for the education of its faculty and of its students, means that Harvard today is not just located in Boston and Cambridge. Harvard is located wherever its people are. Our ambition is not just to specialize on a branch campus here and there. Our bet is the world. That's our physical space. That is what we want to do. That is the university that is enhanced to all of these objectives. And to try to make sure that we cooperate and we learn with you, free from dogmatism, free from labor market protectionism, free from arrogance free from university bureaucrats like me, and especially free to accept, to enhance, and to promote the best work from the best people of the world, passport by. Thank you. Good evening. I am so grateful to uh, several friends here. Uh, Meena, Namrata, Anjali, Gargi, uh, Russell for inviting me. 
And thank you for your wonderful introduction, uh, Gargi, to start us off. But it's about four months uh, uh, ago that that was my bio. Sorry. So, well, no, but that's my mistake. I probably sent it to you. Yeah. So just to bring you a little bit up to date, I want to talk a little bit, three things I want to talk about with you. One, a little bit about my personal journey. Two, some of the challenges that uh, and priorities that I face in my current position. And three, uh, what we've learned from Harvard. Uh, basically, the topic of the evening is uh, building world-class education. What lessons does Harvard offer? And my particular topic is leading a world-class management school. So personal journey, I graduated from um, an engineering college here. IIT Delhi in 1981, and then, like many um, students in India, went straight to my MBA, something in retrospect I would probably not do. I'd probably work for two years or so. Went straight to for an MBA to Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. Had two wonderful years. Graduated from there in 1983, and then at that time I felt I have to, uh, I really want to teach. I uh, uh, loved um, uh, uh, the classroom teaching setting. It was taught by the case method that we were taught there. Loved that approach. My mother's a school teacher. I think I always felt uh, academics was a noble profession. But then at uh, I am what I noticed was that the instructors who had work experience tended to be a little bit more credible in the classroom than uh, some of the others who may be very bright but didn't have work experience. So I said, I'll... Uh, work for maybe two years or three years and see how the real world operates and then go for a PhD. But two years, like the blink of an eye, uh, became five. I worked with the Tata group, enjoyed myself immensely. And uh, I still remember uh, my wife actually giving me the ultimatum. I was um, <clears throat> sick at home and she said, Ashish, every time there's an issue that comes up at work, you say, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm anyway going into academia. You are not uh, getting any younger, so make up your mind. Either you are going to go for a doctorate, in which case apply, and you are sick, so you don't have your usual ex excuse that I don't have time, so apply for a PhD, or stop saying that you'll do a PhD. And so it's entirely because of my wife's um, uh, uh, kind of encouragement uh, that I then applied to Harvard. And I must tell you a story about uh, Harvard, which to me gives me a sense of what makes institutions special. So I applied to Harvard. I applied for a PhD in business economics. And uh, they admitted me, and I was thrilled. And I went back to the Tatas. I was working with a very good, uh, uh, I was a um, uh, kind of organization within the Tatas. Tatas itself is a very good group. For that group, it's called Tata Administrative Services. And so you get flavors of different companies at uh, fairly senior level. So I went to my uh, uh, boss and I said, I've got this offer to go to Harvard. Can I please uh, take a leave of absence and go? My boss said, you know, we'll give you a leave of absence if you wish. But he took out some statistics. He said, over the last uh, uh, 15 years, uh, I forget the exact number, but it was something like 19 people have left on leave from Tata Administrative Services to go abroad. And uh, 18 have not come back. <laughs> and so he said, uh, Ashish, here's what we'll do. We'll give you a significant promotion and give you a position in Delhi to, uh, you know, I had just suggested a project so you can lead that project. It was fantastic. So I wrote back to Harvard. I said, thank you for inviting me, but uh, uh, I uh, have got this wonderful opportunity. Can I defer my admission? <coughs> So what they did was, they said, this is crazy. How can we be having this conversation from oceans apart? Here's an air ticket. And uh, come and stay here for a week, and then make up your mind. You know, I had never flown business class before. They gave me a business class ticket. Never flown business class before. They put me up in Charles Hotel, which is a five-star hotel. You know, I still remember the first meal I ate there. I was converting it to Indian rupees. I just, I just eaten what a family would take, you know, a week, uh, a week's food. But again, you know, you go there and uh, you meet the faculty there, people whose books you've been reading. I, I was sold for life. So I'm uh, from that moment on. I felt 
if they have that much degree of commitment to you, you want to give something back. And so I did my PhD there, and I was very fortunate. I, Harvard Business School invited me to stay on uh, as a faculty member there, taught there 13 years. And then I moved over to Harvard Law School. The then dean of Harvard Law School, now a US Supreme Court judge, Elena Kagan, uh, invited me over to the law school and said, just keep doing what you're doing in the business school. Do it in the law school. Law school, you get very bright students. Actually, all my business school friends get very upset when I tell them, having taught in both schools, the brighter students are at the law school. <laughs> <laughs> They're not as worldly wise, though. <laughs> They're bright, but not worldly wise. But uh, anyway, so I, she said, just come over to the law school and do it. So I had seven wonderful years at law school. Wonderful years, teaching there um, and also teaching in exec ed. And then I came to India last uh, December of 2012 for the 30th reunion of uh, IM Ahmedabad, my batch. And it was wonderful. I came with my wife and uh, uh, those of you who've been to IMA, I know several of you are alumni of the place. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a, an uplifting campus. It's Louis Kahn buildings and uh, my memories and you know, I could just take her through various pathways and tell her I, I was transported back to my days as a student there. And around that time, just as we were enjoying our 30th reunion, the chairman of the IMA board uh, said, you know, we are looking for a director. And would you like to consider this? So I went back to my wife and I said, you know, this is kind of nice, what an honor. Uh, kind of said it with an attitude that, of course, I'll say no and uh, nice honor and so on and so forth. And uh, she said, but why don't you consider it more seriously? Uh, you've been so happy here, which I had been. And uh, she said, this is a stage in your life where perhaps we can go on an adventure. So we have one son who has uh, just started medical school. Uh, and um, I think we've done reasonably well, so we, and we don't have significant needs, so I think I can, economically, no, it's not uh, terribly important. And more than anything else, what she said was, I, the happiness I had seen in you, if you can capture some of that, it would be, uh, it would be well, worth, well worth the attempt. And so uh, September of uh, last year, I actually joined uh, I'm Ahmedabad as director. And I continue to be uh, associated with the law school, Harvard Law School and Harvard Business School. I'm teaching in programs for both. Uh, uh, but I have a position there as a director. And I can't tell you how happy these last four months have been. Uh, every time I say that, um, some, my wife who always brings me down to ground when I get too lyrical, they oh, yeah, 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 this is honeymoon period. Uh, <laughs> This honeymoon period is kind of continuing on and on. I can't tell you the satisfaction one feels coming back to an institution that you feel has contributed a lot to who you are. And I think I am has contributed a lot to who I am today. And to go back to that institution and to have a feeling that you may perhaps be able to contribute some, it's very, very uh, uh, comforting and uh, uh, enriching. Uh, so last four months have been great. People have been very welcoming and warm. You always worry a little bit when you go to a professional organization, particularly an academic institution, what the reception will be. But uh, I think this is in some ways a reflection of India. Uh, people in India have an intense desire across sectors uh, to excel, to do well, um, and to do what it takes. And same in academia, there is a, IMA has a tremendous history, but there is also a great hunger amongst the various constituents in IMA, the faculty, the alumni, uh, the students, uh, to really be uh, uh, considered and to reach um, uh, a level comparable to the best institutes in, in, in the world. So that's been very good. My priorities, uh, I think there are three priorities just now. One, increase the connected, and I'm saying this because I know several of you. I feel a little bit hesitant in kind of giving you wisdom. I'm just telling you where I am. 
and then I want you to critique me in the Q&A and give me some advice. So that's why I'm saying this, okay? That's my uh, goal here. I'm just testing things out with you, and then I want you to tell me if this is right or things should be. So three priorities just now. Priority number one, increase our connectedness. I am a terrific institution, but uh, academia in India has been somewhat closed, and uh, it's been a <coughs> premium institution in a closed market, so it has not built links that a top institution should, or hasn't nurtured that as much as I'd like. So connectedness at three levels. One is with uh, uh, academics the world over, world-class academics. And again, I must say, Harvard has been extraordinary in uh, uh, you know, extending a hand in helping them. Jacqueline, I was just joking with her. Uh, I said, long time no see, because she was with us yesterday in Ahmedabad. And there's a bunch of Harvard faculty who come here who've been saying, we'll come, we'll visit, we'll share some of what we are doing, ask you what you are doing. Uh, Mina spent some time there uh, uh, enjoying kite flying on uh, uh, Uttarayan, uh, but also talking with some of our colleagues and faculty members to see what we can do together. And I think if we can build connections with academics such that we are able to learn from them and work with them, then we'll be at the... Uh, frontiers of knowledge. So that's one, connectedness internationally. Second, connectedness with policy and practice. I've seen the impact Harvard Business School has through its engagement uh, with the world of practice and uh, policy. And I am a, I think we could uh, do more in that space. And so that's the second connectedness. And the third, local community. I am a, there is a little bit of a bubble, those of you who've been there, but for any good institution to really be uh, meaningful, uh, it has to draw roots in the local community. and really. That's one, connectedness. Number two, the second priority is <clears throat> nurture an environment which produces excellent, uh, nurture an, an environment of excellence. And Jorge uh, alluded uh, to some of that. You know, these are lessons perhaps from Harvard. Uh, I study professional service organizations. I think this is true of all high-performing professional service organizations, whether they are law firms or they are academic institutions. So there are three things you need to develop, I think, a vibrant um, uh, environment, work environment. One is a sense of autonomy, what Jorge has said, freedom. People have to have a sense of excitement, enthusiasm, and autonomy about what they are doing. They have to have a sense of ownership of what they are doing. That's one. Second, a sense of stretch. While you should have a sense of freedom, there should be a culture where people feel, I have to accept. This gives me an opportunity. There's an expectation around me. Uh, I have to find and actually exceed my limits. So an atmosphere where people feel that they, they stretch. And then the third is a sense of community, where people work together, exchange ideas, work on projects. So the whole is greater than the sum of parts. And so to nurture and uh, uh, allow an environment to flourish, <coughs> which is one of uh, autonomy, stretch, and community. And then the third is build capacity. And I think this is true of most Indian institutions. When I went to IMA, we had about 400 students uh, in the school, and our faculty was 80. Today we have 1,000 students in school, and our faculty is 90. Okay. Have to build capacity, but build capacity in a way that we maintain quality. Okay? So these are my three priorities. Connectedness, nurture a wonderful environment, build capacity. The third part of my thing was what have we learned from Harvard? IMA actually, when it was established, had a collaboration with Harvard. This tremendous nostalgia and goodwill for Harvard. In fact, the steps I walk up every day to get to my office, we call them Harvard steps. Okay, and there is a tremendous amount of goodwill from Harvard. And we've learned a lot through those early years. <clears throat> the sign for IMA is Vidya Viniyog Dve Vikasa. That's the sign, we, uh, the motto. Which means you grow through knowledge and through humility or through empathy. And I think some of that we've learned from Harvard Business School, which is it's not just abstract knowledge, 
you have to have <coughs> empathy, understanding, appreciation for what you do, both together, and that leads to Vikas growth. So that's one. Second, I think the sense of community that we had historically. It's very interesting when you look back to roots. I am Calcutta was the first time that was set up. I am Ahmedabad was the second time that was set up. And Calcutta at that time was where all the right uh, professors who were interested in management was go were going. Calcutta was the hothouse of uh, intellectual uh, work. I am Ahmedabad, some others were going, but quality-wise, you know, around early 60s. I'm Ahmedabad made one decision, which I think made a huge difference. Early on, they sent faculty in groups to Harvard for a one-year program at the business school. I'm Calcutta sent people one by one. The eight or 10 people who would go for one year to Harvard, you know, it was, uh, you know, suddenly they were in a foreign environment. They were by themselves. They were learning a lot. The bonding that developed amongst them, that was the initial DNA, I think, that has created a sense of community at IMA that to this day is very strong. People have a sense that we are together in it. We, are, we have a sense of shared ownership. And I think that came from the early years of spending time at Harvard, <coughs> working there, of seeing how faculty works there. I think we've learned a little bit about quality. So at a time when many other academic institutions talk about scale, or talk about multiple locations. Uh, we look to, for example, Harvard Business School, which has uh, maintained a campus which is a magnet for the world and has presence externally but has not diluted on that. And to some extent, IMA holds true to that sense that we will grow, but we will make sure that we maintain quality. We have to learn about alumni relations from Harvard a little bit. Good, well-functioning uh, professional school should work in three dimensions. <coughs> I think one, teaching should be excellent. Two, research should be cutting edge and in flow with the best. And three, impact on practice and policy. I think we've learned from Harvard that you've got to balance all three. I think we are very good in teaching. <coughs> we can, I can say with confidence that some of our Good teachers are comparable to the best in the world. Our students who come out partly because of our selection, partly because of our teaching are compared. In research and in practice, we have some ways to go. But hopefully in uh, you know, learning from institutions and working with institutions like Harvard, you learn a lot. That's just a quick uh, kind of introduction. I'm really looking forward to your thoughts and questions and advice. Thank you very much. I don't want to keep us or delay us too long from, from the question and answer, which I think is going to be um, at least uh, as interesting, if not the most interesting part of this evening. But I just wanted to make a few comments. Firstly, uh, again, to thank uh, the organizers, who I think have uh, really made it very easy for the three of us to just float in and, and find a, a great audience. I also wanted to thank um, some friends who are here. P great joy to see some past students who I haven't seen for a while, so that's really an unexpected pleasure. And I suppose I should also thank people for thinking of giving us this opportunity of getting back into thinking about teaching. I'll be on a plane back to Cambridge very soon and confront a classroom like this, so uh, this is a good uh, dry run of getting back into teaching. But. Um, my comments really also cover some of the ground that Jorge and Ashif have already covered. I should say I'm quite happy to have heard Ashif speak after the great introduction because I'm thinking, am I missing something or is this person like double? I thought he was the director of the IAMA. And uh, in fact, he's a, he's a professor at Harvard, so I'm missing something. So I was glad to hear that. And also uh, very glad to hear that in the good old days, Harvard used to fly PhD students, business class. <laughs> <laughs> applicants, not students, applicants. Applicants, <laughs> PhD applicants. So, you know, okay, I think we, uh, we've come we to the to dean for that. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> things have gone downhill all the way. Um, but more seriously, um, uh, I thought I would just uh, really focus my comments a little bit, taking literally the assignments, the relevance of diversity in making a world-class institution and look a little bit at what we mean by world-class institution and then look a little bit at what we mean by diversity. So let me start with the world-class institution because I think there's a tension there. 
World-class institution suggests that we have a kind of a unitary standard. Everybody agrees what a world-class institution is. And then on the other hand, we have this idea of diversity. So difference, how, how do these two kind of uh, entities relate to each other? So, um, and, and Ashish already mentioned some of this. I think a world, what do we mean by a world-class institution? What, what, what would a world-class institution look like? So I would say there are at least three things that it should have. And it could be university, it could be a hospital, it could be a military um, entity. Firstly, clearly the product has to be considered excellent along the standards that, that govern the institution. So I guess in the case of, of a university, we're thinking about the education of the next generation. You have to produce, your product has to be something which stands up to scrutiny, which prepares uh, the consumers for what they come to you for. So that's something we really need to think about. To what extent are we doing that? To what extent are we giving our consumers, our students, something which is which creates which generates value along whatever vector. Secondly, clearly um, for a world class institution of the university, research, quality of research, so innovation, um, invention, interpretation, how do we interpret what is really excellent added and uh, value added for knowledge? <coughs> But thirdly, I think ethics are critical, and this is slightly um, neglected, I think, often. I think um, a world-class institution has to make the world a better place. It's not enough just to be excellent in generating geniuses. It's not enough just to produce great research, um, which adds to knowledge. I think it also means setting a standard of behavior, because after all, this is something that takes place within a very unequal and very unjust and divided world. So I think leading by example, and I think this Jorge mentioned the, the H in Harvard and humility and the, the kind of difficulty of combining the two, I think it's really essential to think about that and to think about how we contribute to that project of, of really making the world a better place, however we can screw that. So. I think those are some of the elements of a world-class institution, and it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts, but I would suggest that without <coughs> them, we probably don't have one. Um, okay, let's look a little bit at diversity. So, of course, there are multiple areas uh, where diversity could be a criterion, right? Many standards, many approaches, many goals. Um, but I want to just focus on a couple. Um, a couple of different areas. So, of course, the most obvious is the student body in the context of university discussion. And Jorge mentioned that, you know. And, of course, in India, there's a lot of discussion about reservations and uh, affirmative action uh, broadly, broadly construed. So, um, I think we've thought a lot about demographic issues. So, we've thought about race, religion, gender, class, caste, social economic level, disability, indigeneity. But there are other areas of diversity which maybe we need to think more about. Let me mention one which is particularly of relevance to me, which is your status, your legal status. What if you are undocumented or irregular? And it's an issue in India too. If you are a migrant from Bangladesh or if you have a problematic status because your parents are stateless. Many thousands, tens of thousands of kids are in that position. Of course, in America, there are millions in that position. What should a world-class institution do? What is the ethical position on that? I don't think it's easy. I think it's a difficult question. But I think when we're talking about diversity, there are types of diversities which have become nearly acceptable, you know, and, and perfectly uncontroversial. But there are other types of diversities which are still challenging. And so I think when we're thinking about a world-class institution, we need to be broadly open to that. <coughs> okay. Um, another issue is how, how do we deal with... Um, with tolerance, and you know, Jorge spoke about the various freedoms. How do we deal with freedom of speech? How far should freedom of speech go? How do we deal with different opinions about sexuality, different opinions about race, about politics within, say, the student body? And we've had our fair share of controversy at Harvard, including at Harvard Law School, on that topic. And of course, as you know, there's a big debate about this, a big difference of opinion, in a way, broadly speaking, between America and Europe, you know, between the First Amendment approach, which is really to privilege freedom of speech, freedom of expression, 
and the European approach, which really is much more about checks and balances and much more about the potential dangers of unre unrestricted speech. And so I'm not going to get into a legal lecture, but I think it's an issue. I think it's an issue in any institution <coughs> where there is real diversity. To what extent are unpopular views acceptable or actually protected? So, you know, where you have a consensus of <coughs> opinion about politics, what happens to the student who disagrees? Where you have, so, you know, if you have a liberal institution, which, for example, is, is, you know, tolerant and inclusive, what about the student who is homophobic? How do you deal with that? What do, how do the other students deal with that? Or in the Indian context, I, it was interesting, I was, uh, about 10 days ago, as part of our research, I was in a small university which would never even come on the radar of a world-class institution, a, government, a girls' government college, about 150 miles outside of Jaipur, as part of this uh, research that we're doing. And we got uh, second-year students from uh, illiterate families to fill out a questionnaire. And as part of doing that, we asked them to just put their names down. And I noticed that quite a few, maybe 20%, only put their first names and not their surnames. And so I said to my colleagues who are the researchers, you know, we must make sure, this is just like our pilot when we go and do the research, that we ins insist that people, that the girls put down their, both their names. And why do you think they didn't? And so my colleague, actually, the, the professor who'd invited us to her college, <coughs> you know, they were probably Dalits, and it's embarrassing to put down your surname because then everybody knows. And so they just put down Anita. So we had Anita 1, Anita 2, and Anita 3. <laughs> but there you go. That was an interesting learning experience. I mean, I had, it didn't even occur to me that that might be the reason. So how acceptable was it in that student body to be openly identified as being from the Dalit class? And so that was an issue for me. Anyway. Okay, so diversity in the student body. Um, admission criteria. I think this is another very big issue for universities. Of course, some of that is, you know, commonplace now. You know, we talk about the importance of, of ensuring, you know, a level playing field and so on. And we talk about the importance of, of, of ensuring diversity. But how do we really ensure diversity across many vectors? I feel that, and I was talking to, to one of you earlier about this, that so much about admissions now is propelling these adolescents into this kind of rat race of achievement. So you need to have all your academic achievements kind of spot on. You need to be right up there in the 99.9th .9 percentile. But then you have to have all your extra extracurriculars, and then you have to have all the other things you've done and so on. So by the end of it, your CV is longer than, than mine, and you're already 17 years old, you know. <laughs> so how do you, how do you deal with that? And of course, this is, you know, in a way, it's farcical. But in a way, it's very troubling. We know about depression and suicide rates and the stress, I mean, at Harvard, and I'm sure this is maybe true at IMA too, Rishish, I don't know, the mental toll it takes on students and on families to achieve these sort of goals of admission. So maybe we need to think about as we think about diversity, and also how do you measure things like looking after your grandmother? How does that stack up with starting an um, NGO working in, in, you know, in the, in the slums in in your city, how, how do you measure those things? And what are we really pushing these kids to do? So it's just, I don't have answers, but these are questions that strike me when we're talking about, about diversity and um, about, about how we do that. And then let me just make a little plug for my, kind of one of my pet hobby horses, which is the question of, of gender. I think in, in India, for example, you know, a lot of strides have been made, partly, um, personally, I think, quite justifiably with the reservation policy. So you actually have, um, you know, 25%, 30%, depends, uh, reserved places for SCST, OBC, etc. Now, you know, disabled or differently abled uh, students as well. But, there's a, but there is no such thing for, for girls. Um, IMA, for example, um, which is really a absolute centre of excellence, it was wonderful to visit yesterday. I was just looking, Ashish, at your um, very impressive annual report, and in your statistics, this diversity. So, for example, 50% um, of the incoming class, uh, 200 actually, out of 381 students, are, you know, SCST, OBC, etc. That's amazing. That's an incredible statistic. But only one in six are girls. So that's, you know, 
near enough 50%, a bit less than 50% of Indian population <coughs> going down are, are women. And yet here you have this real beacon of, of, of uh, progressive thinking at success, and you have one in six. So that's just an issue to think about. Okay, my last point um, is uh, just what are the other issues about diversity that we might want to think about? And let me just very briefly mention three. Firstly, faculty. So how do we think about diversity in faculty? Obviously, we think, as Jorge said, about the kind of nationality and the other sort of gender of faculty and so on. But how do we really ensure that? Um, for example, how do we deal with the relationship between excellence in research and excellence in teaching? And this is something I actually think Harvard has not sorted out at all. <laughs> because really, we reward excellence in research. And people are constantly pushed to publish and to achieve in that, in that domain. And, you know, it's great if you get good teaching evaluations, but that's really not going to get you tenure. It's not going to get you... It'll get you a prize for being a good teacher, so that's great. But it's not really valued in the same way. And so, actually, Jorge, Domingo, uh, Jorge Frank... Not Jorge, Julio Frank, who's our dean of the School of Public Health, in his wonderful speech launching the second century of the school, we just celebrated 100 years as the first School of Public Health in the world, so uh, he said, you know, I think we need to think about how we deal with this. I think we need to think about rewarding faculty who are superb teachers as much as we reward faculty who are superb <coughs> researchers. And I think that's a really kind of radical thought. So I just put that out there. Um, we still haven't sorted out um, the gender issue for faculty very hard once you've had a baby to get back on track and to really not be downgraded, to miss out. So, you know, a lot of steps have been taken. I'm not sure what happens here in India. I don't know enough about it, but I know that at Harvard we've tried to, and we did a lot of what's gone into it, but we're a long way away. I mean, the Kennedy School, which are, where I teach, you know, I mean, it's just a handful of tenure professors who are women. Um, and at least 50% of the student body, that's not right. So, you know, we have a long way to go on that. Um, and finally, teaching methods. You know, this is a cl Harvard classroom, and um, if it was a law school classroom, I would be firing questions. <coughs> it's a crap Socratic me method. If it was a business school, I would have a case, you know, IMA. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the Kennedy <laughs> School, I'm not sure. We do a bunch of different things. But, um, and, and my students know that I use... A, a, a range of techniques, but I think that um, the kind of balance between theory and practice is something we still haven't completely cracked and need, we need to do better at. So we need to think about simulations, for example. We have colleagues who do this simulation of uh, a humanitarian emergency in a kind of bleak field outside uh, Boston, if you can imagine, but they actually make it pretty credible. So. Um, you know, living that experience of dealing with a humanitarian emergency as a teaching opportunity. Um, that's one thing I think to think about. How do we actually generalize from that approach? How do we think about simulations uh, and, and real life experiences uh, to, to diversify the way we teach? And of course also how do we think about the relationship between the space of excellence like Harvard or IMA and doing distance learning? making our curriculum, our teaching, our great professors widely available to everybody. So, of course, we have edX as a new initiative. But how do we think about that? How do we think about diversifying along those vectors? So, um, these are some of the questions that strike me. I should say, in concluding, that um, I think we have come a long way. And I think it's thrilling for those of us who spend most of the year uh, in Boston and in the States to actually go around Indian universities and <coughs> learn from so many, uh, so many real kind of wonderful ideas of excellence that are there. And so I hope this dialogue will, will continue and flourish. And thank you so much. So everyone, we'll move into the Q&A section. So um, just some ground rules. Uh, before you guys can fire away. One is, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, please, uh, you know, direct your question either to one of the panelists, all the panelists, just be specific in, in who you're addressing. Uh, 
uh, we have been requested to also share a bit about ourselves. Just you know, one quick thing. Like I work at Mahindra and uh, in launching an affordable housing business with them. And the last piece is um, pre please be concise and brief. Or as uh, Jorge uh, provided me the euphemism, please at least end your statement like a question. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> with that, uh, please. Can I ask a question to uh, Jackie Baba? Yeah. Did you say we have to introduce ourselves? Yes. I'm Sameer Somaya, and uh, I work in a nonprofit in education called Somaya Vidya Vihar. And as well as I run a company which does uh, biorefining, so I have two hats. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, how does an institution, how should an institution deal with punishment? Which means, for example, when I came to the Kennedy School, I was told if you do not reference properly, you could be asked to leave the university. Just as an example, so how should an institution deal with punishment? Is it to correct or is it to banish one? And secondly, in the admissions issue, when we talked about having people from all over the world, is there, is, if I looked at Harvard, is its responsibility to also change the world whereas and ignore its immediate surroundings? Or should it also, I'm not saying it ignores, but you see a whole bunch of schools right next to Harvard which are not doing so well. So these are my two questions. Do you want to answer straight away or do you want to take a bunch of questions? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start with yeah, thing. Thank you for those questions. Um, punishment. Um, it's a good question. I think um, the answer is really depends. There's some types of conduct which I think Harvard rightly has uh, a fairly draconian policy. So I think if a student um, you know, commits a criminal offense like raping another student, then there's really... Um, you know, the criminal law takes over <coughs> and the student will be sent out from Harvard. Um, if a student uh, doesn't reference properly in the sense that they don't know how to reference, they need to learn. If they uh, are guilty of plagiarism because they kind of copied a whole chunk of somebody else's work and not acknowledged it, takes a very hard view, doesn't always banish them. I mean, I had a student recently who got into trouble along those lines, and she just failed that class, and so she had to stay on an extra semester. So that seemed to me a pretty reasonable compromise. So I think it's, you know, there is a balance. You are an edu educational institution, so you want to teach. But you are also an ethical institution, and so there are certain types of conduct which are intolerable. So I think it is a question of finding that balance. But actually, I'm sure Jorge has thought about it more than I have. So I don't know if you want to say anything on that. So uh, just to elaborate on this, so in many instances, take the example you yourself use, proper citation or plagiarism at the worst. Often with a first-year student who might be 17 years old and has just arrived, uh, that student simply may not know how to do this. I have been a freshman advisor, I've, and I had a freshman student, a young woman from Lebanon, and she didn't know how to do this. She was accused uh, by one of the teaching fellows of having committed plagiarism, and after a lot of discussion, that this, these cases take a great deal of time, the idea was she had clearly made a mistake. It was important for her to understand what it was, uh, and then had to do the assignment again. So there was an element of punishment, but it really was for an educational purpose. We had another case not all that long ago when a large number of students, and of course in my department, uh, engaged in a case of plagiarism. And though the particular detail I'm about to give you was not made public, it is <coughs> what made it so dramatic. This was a take-home assignment, and students had copied from each other. As it turns out, what they had copied included a mistake. It included spelling mistakes. It included <laughs> punctuation mistakes. And they were all identical. So it turned out to be easy to determine that this was a case of dumb plagiarism. But plagiarism, nevertheless, and they were required to withdraw for a year. They were then allowed to reapply. Uh, but it was very clear that what they had done was demonstrably wrong. I'm going to very quickly answer your second question about 
you know, your immediate environment. And I think Ashish spoke very importantly about that. So, um, I mean, Harvard does, I think our, our current president has really made a very uh, strong point about relating to Boston and to Cambridge and has really built good relationships with, with, with the, or improved relationships with the local community after all, some of the debacle around Alston and planning difficulties. Um, I think we do some things quite well. So a lot of Harvard students from undergrads right through to, to sort of uh, doctoral students and so on work, do sort of work in the community. Um, whether it's the homeless shelter in Harvard Square or whether it's the housing clinic that the law school runs for you know, tenants facing eviction and um, those are the things I know about. Um, we, some of us, uh, my team included, are actually doing work in our own front yard, so to speak. So I work on trafficking, uh, human trafficking, and we're looking at sexual exploitation of children in Harvard Square and in Cambridge and in Boston and in Massachusetts, working together with the local commission of police. So I think it's very important in my field as human rights and it's very important for students to learn that human rights starts at home. Um, I think we don't do enough of working with the other institutions in Boston. <coughs> we work very closely, of course, with MIT and so on and Tufts to some extent. But I think that, you know, there's Suffolk, Northeastern, there are tons of institutions. And some of us do often recruit our interns from those institutions on purpose, as it were. But I think we could do better. <coughs> Um, uh, the gentleman in the back. Mm -hmm. Me. Ashish, you said the lawyers are smarter than us. Yeah. I wonder yeah. why there are so many more jokes about lawyers in the US <laughs> than about <laughs> business. The jokes are usually about smart people. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they are smart. So here, here are some stereotypes. They are smarter, they are less worldly wise. Mm -hmm. You've got to do something with world, work experience. Okay? Much better at writing. When I went to law school, you know, law firms always say, oh, they should be, they should do better writing. Going from B school to law school, it was such a pleasure. They write so much better. <laughs> B school PowerPoint has totally destroyed writing ability. <laughs> okay. The other thing, very smart people, but you put a simple arithmetic formula, like 2 plus 3 equal to 5 on the board, their eyes glaze over. You know, they're just deathly scared of unfettered. Leave aside math. I'm a victim of it at 300 bucks an hour. Believe me, it's the worst experience you can get. So, but that, that was not my question. My question on women, all of you were, had brought it up. When I was at Harvard Business School, there were 4% women. They were actively recruiting. They wanted to. I think Dean Clark a few years ago was leveling out at 37%. He was frustrated. He said, I don't know what to do basically. So there was really a push over there. You folks mentioned it. And uh, I was going to say last year here, there was a leading lawyer lady in town invited to a, a group like this of various schools. And she said, women are the low hanging fruit in India. If you can bring them out, India would change. How do you take the constructive one thing that Harvard wants <coughs> bring it into India. And one, and then lastly, a quick thing on why why did IIT and IAM stop growing? I mean, they're wonderful. So how do you balance politics and policy? Okay. Let me take the second question, really, because I have a slightly different view from um, Jacqueline uh, on um, uh, diversity, and I just want to share that. First of all, we don't have the diversity of uh, people that I would like to see in IMA. In fact, when I went to IMA, I went to different classes. My MBA, uh, the head of MBA programs took me to different classes and I wanted to ask the student, I said, what's your academic background? And I started by asking how many of you are engineers and I wanted to ask how many of you are commerce graduates and arts and economics. I had to stop at engineers because in a class of 85, the 83 of them <laughs> were engineers by background. So that's one dimension of diversity. <coughs> Very strong, and it's bad. I'm an engineer by experience. It's bad for the engineers themselves to be in a case-driven classroom where everybody else has the same academic background. So th that's, there's something to do with the way we select people. Second, on gender. 
You know, it's my wife. I took her to uh, IMA. She was looking at the portrait of students. I was so proud. All these people are sitting, kind of professional, wonderful. And she starts counting the number of women there. Okay? It <coughs> used to be about 8% of the women, or 8% of the class in 81 to 83 batch was women. We made progress at the rate of like 1% per year. And now it is something like 18%. So we have to improve diversity. However, the kind of suggestion that Jacqueline had that we should have quotas, I totally disagree. I think that's the easy way out. The tough way out is to encourage women to participate, to make our admission such that the best candidate can come in. And the example I give is MIT. 15 years ago, or maybe 20, MIT said, we don't have enough of women in our undergrad programs. And there were other, there were MIT professors who said, ah, but doesn't matter, Caltech has even less. <laughs> okay, and they said, no, we are losing some really low-hanging fruit. So what they did was they went out to schools, told them, come to MIT, took some women who had done very well as role model, and it took them about 15 years. But today, I think MIT has about 50% of undergrads who are women, and it's considered one of the most women-friendly colleges. That's the way to get equality, not by giving kind of, by the way, the people who are most against giving a quota for women, guess who? Women, women students at the school. They say, we don't want to be, you know, the people who, people will say, oh, they are kind of second tier people <coughs> brought in by the back door. So I have a difference on that. You spoke very kindly about your wife. <laughs> you, you brought her not serious. I just had tea with Mr. Coley on the business. So Indian Nina course. knows my wife. I didn't speak kindly of my wife. She is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I just spoke with Mr. Coley on the article on TCS. I was in Business India. I said, what do you think about it? He said it was wonderful that they brought uh, Chandrasekharan's wife into the picture. You folks have it, right? How do you distill that to the bottom levels of India? Or do we, I mean, or is this only a consideration of IITs? Is there a way of pushing it down, that attitude? My goal, I, my mandate is five years. I'm going to focus like a laser on IMA, and at the end of these five years, I want IMA to be an excellent institution. There are other things I care about, but my first focus is to take IMA and make it an institution that everyone in India would be proud of. I think for India to be the kind of economy and nation that it is, the growth path, the brilliance of people we have, when we identify the top 20 management schools, IIMA should be one of them in the world. That's my objective. There are other things I can worry about, like what to do about other schools and so on, as a concerned citizen, but this is my primary objective. I'd like to just jump in question and I mean just to have a discussion so I, I mean I wasn't actually advocating quotas but I think quotas are actually a very good idea and I think maybe we need to think about what we've learned uh, from the resolutions that exist at the moment. Um, I think the analogy with MIT only goes so far Shish, because um, you know if you look at high school graduations in the US you'll find 50% of boys and 50% of girls if you look at high school graduations, let alone undergrad college admissions in India, you will not find anything approaching that. Only less than 6% of rural girls go to college in India. So we're still in a completely radically different situation. And of course, it would be great just to say, encourage the girls. But it's actually not so easy. And so it's not easy for the girls. It's not easy for their families. You know, I mean, I'm not telling people here anything they don't know about the enormous obstacles that, that, young, that girls and young women face. So I think, as with any affirmative action program, it has to be limited. And there's a time when they, it becomes redundant, and you don't need it anymore, and that's great. But I think if you just look at the progress, look at the, if, if it had been for reservations, there would not be 50% of I, I, uh, MA students would not be from underprivileged backgrounds. And those students, I gather from talking to your colleagues, your, your, your faculty, do extraordinarily well. They do <coughs> extraordinarily well, and of course, they also influence their other peers. So it's important to have, as the Supreme Court in the US has said many times, it, it doesn't just benefit benefit the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, etc. Um, you know, Dalit or whatever you want to call them, students. It also benefits the middle class students from from Bombay and Ahmedabad to have a, an experience and close con connection. Similarly, <coughs> on the gender question. So I think that. 
at the moment, given the situation, given the radical inequality in schooling, the radical inequality <coughs> in opportunities for excellence in college, questions of safety, questions of sexual harassment, questions, of course, then of marriage and so on, uh, it's actually imperative to think about targeting gender in a way. I think that if you just spend your next five years encouraging, I, I, be, I wonder how good your statistics are. So, will Jacqueline, be. time for another debate. Anjali, we should have a debate on this sometime. Okay. <laughs> I feel, Jacqueline, IIMA actually doesn't bear the brunt of the quotas. We will be compliant with the laws that exist. Laws make it that 50% of our students have to be from various categories. We are fortunate. Do you know what percentage of applicants join IIM? Take a guess. Half a percent. Point three percent. When that's the level at which you're getting people, you'll get the best from anywhere. Institutions where the difference becomes really acute is some of the second tier, the newer IIMs, where it is a different, it's an acute difference. So I, you know, we should have a debate sometime about uh, be, uh, here, my, here the economist in me comes out which says quotas are an easy way to solve problems exposed, but ex ante create inefficiencies. But time for a debate. Uh, let, me, let me just add the uh, <laughs> different point of quotas, but the same topic. Yeah, so one of my themes was <coughs> mistakes Harvard has made. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, let me use something that I know directly. So in my department, there was no woman senior faculty member until the well into the 1970s. And it was because the then senior, the Harvard system as senior faculty members have to vote and make a recommendation. They simply had refused to recommend someone who had the title of lecturer, who had actually published more books and probably better books than the majority of the senior faculty. And what occurred was the then president of the university, Derek Bach, put the department in receivership <coughs> and told the senior faculty, you have two choices. You can either vote to appoint Judith Sklar, professor of government, or I will take away your appointment rights and the Harvard Corporation, the trustees, will appoint her professor of government. They came back unanimously recommending her appointment, <laughs> which they have refused to do. But this is an example of the importance of leadership from the top, where you come in and intervene. Second, much smaller, I, among the things I do is I chair a postdoctoral program. We also, I was just reminded of it because it's called the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies. We appoint fewer than 1% of the applicants. We get whoever we want. When I became chair in 2005, I noticed that four out of five appointees were men. I have no idea why. Uh, I was not president of the university, didn't want to be, but I simply rotated the membership. And now, characteristically, we appoint half and half. Not because we actively choose to do so, but because that's what it happens. These are enormously <coughs> talented people, and it's not surprising that approximately half are men and half are women. And so term limits on appointments committees or admissions committees. Okay, uh, one from this section, um, uh, Vivek. Uh, Vibhak Agzi, MBA class of 2010. I run an admissions advisory called Reach Ivy, so we assist students getting into the Ivy Leagues from India. I also work with Minerva, which is a California-based startup in the higher ed space, and we're actually admitting our first class for 2014 now. So my question obviously pertains to admissions. First to Mr. Nanda, you talked about the lessons you learned from Harvard. Any lessons on admissions? Because in India, we're still a cutoff related society. You know, State Stephens, 99% cutoff. With even the IAMs, it's first the CAT, and then you have the GD, and the interview, and the discussions, and whatever. But we're primarily grades oriented. Whereas in the US, even though it's a roster of accomplishments, probably more than most of us have accomplished at 17, these kids are, you know, completely out of whack. But still, there is some component of, you know, getting a lower SAT score or getting a GMAT score. Stanford has a range of like 590 to 760 this year. So there is at least a range of acceptance, which in India we don't have. And uh, to Professor Hore, similar question, when you talked about the history of Harvard, anything in the history of admissions you could talk to us about? Because obviously the kind of applicants even we see going from India, it's absolutely unrealistic that at 17, you do have, in fact, this roster of accomplishments. So what level of it is actually real? What level of it is sort of, I don't know, you know a little bit of salad dressing or window dressing or whatever? 
So can you tell us about you know, admissions and how are you looking at reevaluating admissions as you build the next century of Harvard University? Oh, let me uh, <coughs> take a try. So you're talking about admissions to the first university degree, what for us would be Harvard College. Uh, so there has been an important change uh, for the following reasons. So now for several years, so this has not happened once, it now happens every year, has been happening for several years. <coughs> the number of students with a perfect mathematics score on the college boards, the SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, perfect mathematics score is 50% larger than the number of spaces in the entering class. So to just let that thought settle on your mind. 50% larger, again, it's the, the point you were making about quality. It means that Harvard College admissions must reject every year hundreds of students with a perfect mathematics score. And once you reject several hundred, you keep rejecting. You feel liberated. <laughs> <laughs> Having a perfect score in mathematics is not good enough. And you need to look for a different criterion. That different criterion is very difficult, just as your question implies, and Jackie quite rightly mentioned in her remarks. Uh, the word, and it's a buzzword, but it is the word we use, is called leadership. And you will find it for the college, you will find it in the business school, you will find it in the Kennedy School of Government, in the school of, we look for people who demonstrate elements <coughs> of leadership. The element of leadership could be, I was born a Dalit, and I have changed something significant in my life, that suggests that I might be able to do other things in life. So it does not mean that you have to start five NGOs and run three newspapers by the age of 17, but that you must demonstrate something other than a perfect mathematics score. That, I think, is a reasonable goal to expect from someone by the age of 17. It is one reason why the number of Indians of Harvard across degrees over the last 20 years jump from uh, 89 to 264, a much faster rate of increase uh, than for students from other parts of the world. By the way, in that same time period, the number of students coming to Harvard from Japan was cut in half. <laughs> Their ability to show leadership in a remarkably parochial country is not good. Let, let me actually pick up on where uh, Jorge was. So at IMA, we went the opposite direction when we found that they were the equivalent of perfect scores, partly using the argument that we are very proud that we have a system of admissions which is uh, independent of outside influence. But also, we said it should be seen to be fair. And we used the argument of RTI inquiries, et cetera, to say that it should be totally objective. Now, if you are totally objective and you are trying to re recruit people using a totally object, you know, a system where no judgment is used, if this is the distribution of students, you want 0.3 percent. Guess where you are going? And if you want a test to actually distinguish those 0.3 percent students, then the test you have is not for people who are facile in mathematics. It is for people who are literally rocket scientists. Okay, when I went for my MBA, we used to have 180 questions or 120 questions in three hours. Number of questions has reduced to 60. Time is still three hours. People who set those questions, there's a kind of war of attrition. Oh, you made such a tough question? I have such a tough question. So people who get in are rocket scientists. No wonder when I go to my class, these are all engineering students. No wonder when I am actually, uh, you know, so, so these are the people. Are they the best raw material for people who will become leaders in the field of business and entrepreneurship? No. So what we need to do, and that's something we are talking about at IMA, is have a two-step process. Number one, kind of like your Stanford, a cutoff somewhere here where people show that they are facile. And once they are facile with various elements, uh, math, but as well as uh, you know, articulated. Then we do some sort of a test, which is more like a group discussion or such like, 
where we get a sense of how well they work with folks. Response to that from people has been, oh, it will be costly in time and energy. Maybe we can learn from Howard and have a, a, an independent admissions group that is doing this. So we are actively moving in the direction of a two-step process. This, by the way, has to do with diversity of input also. At a time when applications to IMAs have been climbing, applications to IMA from people with arts, commerce, and uh, uh, other backgrounds has been declining because they're giving up. And again, on the women's side, a lot of uh, undergrad degrees that women go into, in fact, there the number have been declining. So if we do that, it will probably have a positive. Okay, I understand that um, Ashish uh, actually has to, to leave us. Is that at 8.30. Yeah. At 8.30? Okay. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'm Father Roy Pereira, a Jesuit from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. I'm also vice principal. And we have a different sort of problem. We use merit as uh, a criteria for intake. And in the last years, uh, we have over 70% of women students in college because of the merit. Of course, we've got 80% female faculty. And so the question comes is, if you're looking for diversity, when I was studying in Boston, many of the universities, they keep a 50-50 quota for boys and for girls. But uh, in India, okay, if you're saying merit on one side, diversity, if you even think of saying, are we going to keep reservation for boys so that there's an equal? Because it is affecting. We are becoming a girls' college, and the, the way the dynamics plays out, it's, it's not getting healthy. <coughs> Any suggestions of how do we the way tackle this? I issue? have asked, talked to people about this, is said, we will exercise judgment in choosing this, at least for the MBA class. HBS does it. We are taking a book up. We see what the composition of the class will be. We'll have some norms on judgment. So we will not necessarily say quota, but having diversity of experiences, including gender, yeah. will factor into it. So you don't bind yourself by saying we will have 40, 60, or whatever, but you include this in your considerations. And you are, you are true, you are, you, you tell people ahead of time, this is how we are going to do it, so they know you are fair. Fair is not some object. Fair is not the same as objective. Okay. If I could just say, I think there is a similar problem in the states, which is not so much to do with gender, but to do with sort of <coughs> national or kind of like um, ancestral origin, which is Chinese students are now so successful, particularly Chinese students, that yes. some universities in California, I think, are literally to have the same problem that you have with girls, as it were that there's so many Chinese students, or Chinese American students, Asian American students, it's so successful, that if you didn't watch out, you might have a 99% or 90% yep. university would be Asian American students, and so that would also scupper your <laughs> diversity. So I think these, these issues are, are, you know, they, they manifest in many ways, but it might be interesting for you to look at that debate and to look at some of the, the writing on that to get some ideas about how it's being dealt with. Uh, uh, listen, you, you're quite right. It, it also, to some extent, depends on what is the sense of the, uh, what is trying to accomplish. I would imagine, it has not happened, but I would imagine that in Harvard College that could be a concern if it were to be a trend. I can tell you that in the PhD program that is not at all a concern. And if they're all Chinese in the pure mathematics department because they're the best, that's just fine. <coughs> Just fine. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Um, yes, Kursheed. Hi, Kursheed Karodi. In fact, I was just going to talk to you about the Chinese and Korean phenomenon. I'm a pianist. I also play the cello and violin. I didn't read music at Harvard. Um, I went to the Boston Ballet and the music school separately and did an academic course at Harvard. Um, but I teach here in Bombay. And I play, try and get out to international festivals once a year. Um, and the Chinese and the Koreans top the list. And I spend a long number of hours trying to find out why. And I ask my Russian teachers who coach me every day. And they say it's simple. They work 18 hours a day. They keep their noodles under the chair, eat in the rest, bar rest in music, and just keep playing, whether your fingers are damaged, you need to go to a physiotherapist. What happens then is these, the festivals I play at are dominated by Chinese. So it's Aspen, Juilliard, in England, 
and they're all winning the competitions, the Nafsky competition, the Menuhin competition, and you start to, expectations of the public and the audience go up. So you've got this pressure on you to perform like them. But I wanted to ask two questions. Why are they excelling beyond what I've been told by my teachers? And is it worth it? Um, because expectations, I think, in my field, are now becoming inhuman, um, in music. And it's becoming the fastest, best school of playing. And um, So I run a school, and I'm very particular to tell my faculty that um, the people I work with, I don't care whether the children we teach become pianists or not, but I use the piano as a microcosm of a way of looking at life. Um, and of being a global citizen. And I use the keyboard precisely to do that, and I work with them naturally, not um, <coughs> looking at things in a narrow-minded tunnel, but we're living in a real world. Some of these children want to go like me and play at festivals, and you have to keep the pitch up. And I wanted to talk about where, whether anyone's done intensive research on you know, the way these countries are excelling. Every one of their boys and girls are excelling. I come across them all the time. So I, 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 maybe I could just make two short points. One is autobiographical, which is I also I have, have three children and I did music with them. And the first um, sort of half of their childhood was in England, and then we moved to the States. And in England, uh, you know, I was pretty much of a kind of uh, like an Asian Thai or whatever her name is, the woman. I mean, I used to go up six in the morning and we used to practice every day, like brushing your teeth is kind of non-negotiable. Um, and so my kids played very well, and, and they've learned a lot, and they learned from the discipline of it, and now the love of music. We went to America, and instead of being something that they did as well as, you know, going to school and swimming, and just like part of being an educated and cultured person, in America it's just like, it's pre-professional from the age of three, and I think it's probably like that in Korea, and, yeah. and you know, so it's just like, because actually Asian Americans, Korean kids dominate in America too. And so it changed the whole thing. Like we as parents were expected to be at these music centers at one and two in the morning. And my husband was saying, well, you know, I didn't sign on to this. I mean, what's happened to my family? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think there is this problem about integrating music or sports as part of a rounded childhood and the drive to just, you know, be the number one and the excellence. So that's one issue. In terms of the, um, have people studied it? I only know from the human rights point of view what an issue <coughs> suicide, depression, anxiety is in the educational system in Asia because a lot's written about it. So there, and I think there really is a questioning now. So this idea of being creative, I was talking something about thinking outside the box, creating, I mean, maybe it's the same point Jorge made about you know, Japanese admission going down because it might be very diligent, but actually big thinking and, and, and critical thinking and thinking outside the box is really not encouraged if you're kind of on, on that sort of automaton scale. So I don't know specifically about music, but I think what you say is absolutely evident in any orchestra, in any music school that I've had contact with. So I think it really is an issue. Just a comment on this. So I, I, I think Jackie is quite right uh, that part of what you observe in China and in Korea is the professionalization of practice from the very beginning, and that's one reason it has the result. In the United States, whether it is Korean Americans <coughs> or Chinese Americans, uh, that experience, my hypothesis in this, uh, is that this is a one of the recurrent effects of immigration. It's important to remember that the United States had highly discriminatory legislation against Asians in general, Chinese in particular, until 1965. And so you're now talking about the first opportunities for these immigrant families to do well. One of the experiences from the United States with immigrant families over generations is that they indeed outperform those born in the United States. That is not unique to the Chinese or to the Koreans or to the Indian Americans, but it is a boom, if you will, a demographic boom from which they benefit, and that's one reason they perform well. There's a book called The Smartest Kids in the Room by Amanda Ripley, which came out last year. I think it was number two on the New York bestseller list. It's not a quantitative research of this, but she follows a number of students from different parts of the world who are top performers and sees what their lives are like. And she talks a lot about this peer pressure and of Korean students, so it's going to be something you might enjoy. Well, I, 
think uh, we need to wrap one up. One quick question because of something. Just one line. Okay, one line. Yeah. Okay. This is about the world class university is talking about. Now, uh, would you talk about this uh, protectionism and other things? In Harvard, you can attract world class faculty. But in India and China, that's not easy. Uh, so, how would you advise Indian institutes to go for world class institutes or improving better fa faculty quality? Because once you get good quality faculty, everything falls in line. The autonomy and everything works. And second is the I am Ahmedabad and Harvard has significant influence. You talked about policy and practice. In India, regulation has been a big issue. So, are you using your influence not with the community? or Indian business schools, but also with the government so that a lot more better quality institutes can come up, so that regulations are much more, you know, give autonomy to the institutes. We characteristically uh, realize that often to recruit faculty who don't want to come, it is more expensive. <coughs> Some of it is a question of resource. Uh, India now, as opposed to India 50 years from now, can do this. Maybe not in every institution, but if you really do want <coughs> significant uh, appointments of high quality faculty, it costs money. Uh, and, but it requires a strategic decision that you will do that and perhaps not do something else at the same time. Uh, the <coughs> big change in Harvard's welcoming to uh, faculty from other institutions was to benefit from the disasters of others. It is the Nazis in Europe. And part of it is to become a welcoming community to those who are fleeing from persecution. This is very much the kind of work that Jackie does with children and with, uh, and, and with women. But part of it is to say deliberately, we don't want to uh, celebrate the horrors of others, but we will open our doors to those who are there because it will be good for them and it will be good for us. This means thinking well for <coughs> immigrants. Not every society is ready to do that. So um, I would just like to invite uh, Angela <coughs> Reina uh, to give us a word of thanks. So uh, may I just say the word of thanks from here because I'm absolutely <laughs> running late and Ashi has to catch a flight. I yeah. uh, just want to wrap up this discussion by thanking uh, all of you for being here. Firstly and foremost, our speakers, Ore, Ashish and Jackie, thank you very much for bringing us this world-class discussion and having set up our insights. I'd also like to thank those behind the scenes who helped us design this event's format and managed logistics. So first, the Harvard Alumni Association in Cambridge, and of course, Gargi and Russell from the Harvard Club of Mumbai. Then the IRC in Akshi Sopti and the rest of the team, Anthea, Disha, Rashmi, Kalpesh, and Utkarsh, many of whom registered you and did the uh, uh, logistics outside. Namrata Arora and Meena from the South Asia Institute. Namrata from, uh, yeah, Namrata is here, uh, from the South Asia Institute in India, and Meena from Boston. And also thank you to Vinay and Shirley from Harvard Business Publishing for their support in reaching out to all the educationists in this room, uh, who have certainly made this discussion much more relevant and hopefully more impactful for India. I also want to thank the Taj, who gives us this classroom and who has made it possible for us to be here today. And finally, a very big thank you to each one of the audience members who, through your engagement and involvement and asking of questions, have helped to make this uh, discussion interesting and I hope relevant to everybody here. Thank you. Thank you.